essentially just a little bit about this Prophet uh, Muhammad that you may have heard some pretty crazy things about. Uh, but I want to share with you some very, very basic things. I won't give you a synopsis of his life except to tell you that the revelation, as Muslims believe, began coming to him at the age of 40. Uh, so he starts propagating this message as a messenger of God at the age of 40, and he dies at the age of 63, so Allah But I want you to just picture that scenario. A man at the age of 40, well respected in his community, a good businessman, people associate honesty and ethics with him, he's fairly well known, He's, a, he's also known as one of the more intelligent, so historically when disputes occurred within the Arabs, one of the people that they would resort to to find, to say, this guy, not only is he intelligent, but he's also a neutral party, so we'll go to him, whatever decision he says, we'll go with. So they would resort their matters to him because they saw him as one of the intelligent of their community. This man is now, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, claiming to be a messenger publicly. And he's claiming that revelation comes to him from a higher authority. And not only that, that's, that's hard enough to believe, he's asking something more. He's asking people not only to believe that that's true, that once they believe, they have to understand that whatever he's saying, because it's not his own words, it's the words of God, it's the words of the highest authority, that they have to submit to those instructions without question. Because questioning those words would be the same as questioning God himself. Now, as hard as it would be to believe, even harder you would have to argue it would be to submit your life to someone like that. To just say, I'm going to eat what you want me to eat, I'm going to sleep when you want me to sleep, I'm going to look at what you want me to look at, I will live my life the way you want me to live my life. And by the way, as soon as I believe you, it's only logical that the vast majority of the community, including my own family, what are they going to think about me? He's gone crazy too. I mean, the other one, he was 40, he was so normal yesterday, what happened to him? All of a sudden this crazy talk about angels and messengers and afterlife and you know, don't do evil and pray and be good to your neighbor and I understand the be good to your neighbor part, but this whole messenger bit is a little too crazy, you know? And then now my own son, my daughter, my neighbor, that one became Muslim too? That's crazy, it's spreading. This cult is growing. This is insane. And so this concern began in the community. This is a historical fact. And the first few things that were said about Muhammad were exactly this, he's insane. He's insane. Or he has some ulterior motive for which he is trying to capture the attention of the, the not, so, not so firm in intellect among us. He's trying to catch the, you know, the, uh, let's just say, the easily influenced among us. And he's taking them under his wing, etc. What else does he claim? What else is he talking about? Besides the fact that he's a messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa well, the first thing he comes and claims is that, this, that there is a God, but not only that he is God, but he has a direct relationship with you. And that no one can come in between you and him. There can be no intermediary between you and him. You don't answer to anyone else who can answer for, on your behalf to him. You have to answer to him directly. You owe him a direct obligation. That was a serious problem for that society. And I need to tell you why. Because religion, before Islam, in Arabia, was being used essentially as an industry. As an industry. As it is today, by the way. Including Islam. Some use Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism as an industry. It's a money-making field for some people. And how was it being used then? Essentially, there was this Mecca, which you probably heard of. And they had all these idols around it. And these different idols were from different tribes of Arabia. So all these different tribes would make a sacred pilgrimage to come to Mecca to pay uh, homage, homage to their own god. Because the place to keep your gods would be Mecca. But now all these different tribes, which were essentially warrior tribes, what they lived off of was beating each other up. It was a thing. They, none of them would mess with the Meccans. And they would have no fears. Why? Because if you mess with us, you know your idol back there in Mecca? You know what we're going to do with it when we get back? You know? So nobody would mess with them. But now if this call comes and says, you don't need idols. You don't need an intermediary. You can have a direct relationship with God. This entire system that's set in place, people coming, and of course when people come, what comes with them? Money. It's a tourism industry. I mean, after all, what is Orlando without Disney World? I mean, think about that, right? 
So who, who would want to come here anymore? It's in the middle of the desert. There's no attraction except this, this religious site. If we lose this, the interest of all the Arabs, we have no special status left. And the money that is coming in year round is gone. So they see it as a direct threat. You know, the Arabs had certain, some really messed up practices back in the day. For instance, they thought that having a son is a sign of manhood, and having a daughter is a blemish on your manhood. It's like a shame that you had a daughter. So a lot of Arabs, when they would have, especially higher, higher ups in society, if they would have a daughter, I think the Muslims here know what they would do. What would they do? They'd bury the baby girl alive. It was a practice by the elite of that society. It existed at that time. Now the Qur'an comes, and this man who's being claimed to be insane, claimed to be, you know, just brushed aside, this passage is revealed to him. And he recites it out loud in public. You know, It's a passage about the Day of Judgment. When the sun is wrapped up. And when the stars start, start falling apart. When wild animals are herded together. When the ocean boils over. When the earth is stretched. When, when people start coming out of their graves. When graves are, you know, turned topsy-turvy. And all of a sudden, in the middle of this discussion about Judgment Day, and this really cataclysmic stuff that's going to happen, what is mentioned in the middle? وَإِذَا الْمَوْعُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ بِأَيِّ ذَنْبٍ قُتِلَتْ And on the day when the baby girl will be asked, what crime were you killed for? For what crime was she killed? In the middle of this discussion about Judgment Day, there's this talk about the evil that is happening in that society, and nobody dare question it. Nobody dare question it before these verses. And he starts directly challenging those, for example, another you know, filthy practice, was the orphan is, has no backing. You know, the orphan of, of that time was like basically the illegal immigrant. Has no rights, you can do whatever you want with him. You don't have to pay him, what's he going to do? You want to stay in this country? Get to work. Maybe I'll give you some water. You know, you can abuse the rights of those who don't have a certain status. And in tribal society, having parents, having tribe, having some backing, family backing, is your legal status. So in this tribal society, orphans were just pushed around. Orphans were like the worst kind of victim. The Qur'an comes and starts calling people out for pushing the orphans. What kind of prayer does he make? You know these religious, the, the economic elite, they had to show people that they're also very religious. Because that's what gave them their legitimacy, and then they could do whatever filthy practices they had. So the Qur'an talks about them praying to show off, and then they push the orphan around at the same time. What kind of prayer is this? Prayer is supposed to soften your heart, and this is what you do with an orphan? You know? They're so cheap, they don't even give a little bit in charity? That's what their reality is? Why is it that you, don't, you find them talking to people about religion, their religion, and calling about their God, but you never hear them talk about the rights of the poor, and the rights of the needy, because they themselves are the oppressors against the needy. The point I'm trying to make is one of the first and most offensive calls made by Muhammad وسلم, in his lifetime that is recorded in history is that he called for social justice. And he didn't separate a belief in God with a call for justice. He combined these two things. It was as though if you believe in God, there is no other way but to do what God demands. And our, the God, God is a just, merciful God, and so we have to have a just, merciful society here. What he, want, what he has in the heavens should be here. That's what his call was. What we read as Muslim children, what we read about these, the first generation of Muslims, is incredible. So one of, the, one of the closest companions of the Prophet, very high up, very highly regarded in the community, ended up, he was living in Medina, and he ended up in a dispute with a Jewish man. He was walking by and he saw the Jewish man hold a shield. You know, sword and shield back in the day. He looks at the shield and goes, that's my shield. I've been looking for that for months. And the Jewish man goes, no, this is my shield. What are you talking about? So they get into it. And they go to the ruler, who's of course Muslim. They go to Umar bin al-Khattab, Umar. They go to him and they say, you need to, you know, we need to go to this, take this trial before you. The ruler back in the day was also the judge. So they're at the Supreme Court at this point, And the Jewish man is standing there and Adi is standing there. And of course, Umar knows which one really, really well at this point. He, knows, he doesn't know the Jewish man. He knows Ali. And they go way back. They fought in battle together. They've lived, you know, they've lived many years together. They've been by the side of the Prophet together. They're very close. And in, in, in the Arab world, one of the ways to give people a nickname is to call them by their son's name. 
oh, father of so-and-so. Okay? So, for example, so instead of calling him Ali, he calls him Ya Aba Hussein. Ya Aba Hassan. So what's the deal, father of Hassan? And that's a, way, that's a term of endearment. It's a term of endearment. So he, obviously, because he knows him, he used that term. And he tells him a story. He tells him what his perspective is. This shield is mine. I lost it. This guy had it. it clearly it's mine. You know, I, you know, he makes his case. Now he goes to the Jewish guy. And he says, so what's your story? What's your story? And Ali stops him. He goes, wait. You called me by a nickname. Why did you say to him, hey, what's your story? You should have called him by a nickname too. You're not just. I don't want this case. You win. Walks away. He walks away. They're sensitive to justice. They are, this is what we're taught as children about how, how sensitive you have to be to principles of justice. How sensitive you have to be. Because that is the backbone of this religion. What gave it its strength in the be very beginning was these two things could never be separated. You couldn't be a strong believer in God and then not be just. Because you have to answer to Him. There's a day of justice coming. You know one of the words for judgment day in Arabic is Yom din In the first surah, Yom din din means when everybody gets exactly what they deserve. Exactly, penny for penny what they deserve. So a Muslim is cognizant of that and becomes extremely worried about delivering justice to others. Delivering justice to others. This is, this is the heart of the religion. It's at the heart of the religion. And this conversation, unfortunately, I'll be honest with you, isn't common. Not among Muslims and not among non-Muslims. And it's a tragedy to the religion itself. I started by saying there's a distinction between Muslims and the religion. The texts itself. The sources themselves. An honest study of the texts. An honest study of the texts yields a very different picture than what you may be used to seeing. So I, I would encourage all of you to take some time out and uh, read about the book, read about the Quran on your own time, on your own terms. On your own terms. And make up your own mind. 